I think we have to help people see that that investment of time is like, it's so cliche. It's so cliche, but it's so true. That investment of all of those resources is actually going towards you showing up better, differently, and in a better way for the people you most care about. Hey, what's happening, you guys? Welcome once again to the Proclivity Podcast. I am your host here today, Joel Cochran. I'm here with my co-host, Emily Rodella, and we have a special guest. I love having special guests. Emily, you know why I love having special guests? Why? Because they're special. <laughs> True. <laughs> they're just special. Each one that, that we vet the people that come on for you guys because we want anyone who's coming onto the show to be able to give you some information that's going to help change your life. And without a doubt, GM is one of those people. She is a remote fitness nutrition coach, and she has an extensive background as a competitive athlete running CrossFit and Olympic lifting. She went from uh, she's gone from elite athlete to business owner to mother. GM specializes in helping women give themselves permission to evolve in the season of life that they're in, regardless of where they're starting. I'm very excited to have GM on the show. She is an incredible woman from everything that I have seen and talked to her about. GM, welcome to the Proclivity Podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. You make me sound so good. <laughs> It's because you are. <laughs> I because appreciate that. hundred percent. So GM, what we're going to talk about today, and, and we want the listeners to know, right? You get into that first beginning of the podcast, you're like, okay, I saw the title. What are we going to talk about? Um, I do want to get into you and your background and for you to introduce yourself. But first and foremost, when you or I, I were chatting, we were, we were talking and going, oh man, what, what, what are we going to bring that's going to be special to the show? And the one thing that we landed on was time. Time is such a valuable resource. And yet so often we're just allowing it to, to come and go, come and go. And it starts compounding on us. If we're not claiming our time, it starts compounding where we find ourselves kind of getting broken down. And so today what we're going to be talking about is how to be able to re reclaim your time. Tell me real quick, why was that what came up for you when I was asking, Hey, what do you want to talk about on the podcast? Well, I hear that's like the number one issue I hear from most people is I just don't have time to do all the things. But I believe that we're approaching getting more time back in our day, more time back in our life the wrong way, because it's not mm. you're not going to get you're not going to get more hours in the day. And sometimes you can't take anything off your schedule. Like you can't get rid of your kids. You can't get rid of your husband or your work. These things are there. What are we supposed to do? Just suffer? No. What if we look at time as getting more time from an unconventional approach? Right. Like, well, do you have more energy? Can we be more efficient? If we have more energy and we're more efficient, ta-da, we have more time, right? So are we optimizing our energy? Are we optimizing how we're spending our time, right? Those are things that are going to give you back more time. Yes, yes. It will, and, and okay, I love this, that you're, you're starting right out of the gate here. When it comes to optimizing your energy, give us a little background with you. You know, obviously you're in the position that you're in, due to your history. That's what most people are passionate about the work that they do. Give us a little understanding of why you're the authority to talk about this. Before I had a kid, I had all of the time in the world. I owned a CrossFit affiliate. It was my job to work out. It was amazing. I got paid to exercise. Like, this is great. I'm just going to teach you how to air squat. Okay, awesome. And then things shifted. I had a kid and I noticed like, huh, this is, this is kind of hard, right? So I had to figure out like, okay, my life is different. I still want to be me. I still want to maintain that some, some sort of identity that I had before, right? Because now I'm like this whole new person. My life is different. How can I do that? How can I keep parts of me that I want to keep from my previous life and match it to 
where my life is now, the season that I'm in now, right? And going through like postpartum, I was doing what I did prior to having a kid and it wasn't working. I was exhausted. I was overtraining. I was not sleeping. I was doing like everything wrong, all the red flags. And on top of that, I was hungry. I was so, I was eating like three to 4,000 calories a day, gaining weight. What's wrong with me? I can't figure it out. Well, yeah, you're overtraining. Your hormones are whack. You just had a kid eight weeks ago, right? I just was doing, literally doing everything wrong until I realized, okay, it's starting to impact other areas of my life. It was impacting my work, my relationship, my confidence in myself, my body composition, all of the things that we, let's face it, we care about as postpartum women, right? When I pumped the brakes and started to do less, I had more time to do more. I had more time, more energy, more resources, all of the things that essentially women need in their life when their lives are so full. So by doing less, I was actually doing more, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. oh, 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 you're, you're speaking to the choir right here. Uh, it, it's, it's so interesting, right? When a child comes, uh, there is, and listen, I'm not, I don't have children. Um, I am not a woman. Um, yet I work with a lot of women and when the child comes, it's almost like you want to keep this past identity of yourself and be able to fit in this new child. And it really can throw you for a loop psychologically, physically, mentally, emotionally, the whole gig. And so at what point was your breaking point where you were like, I, I got to do this differently? Was there like a moment where you're like, no, this, this has to change. It has to change now. And what did you do? Yeah, I was 18 months postpartum and I was like, just so beating up, so beaten up on myself, right? Like uh, the negative comments, the total bashing of myself. I can remember like, hiring a friend to help me work on the language because I was convinced I'm inconsistent. I'm broken. What's wrong with me? Before I had a kid, I could work out really hard. I could make, set a goal and stick to it. I had a plan and I stuck to it. And now like I totally lost that part of me. Right? So when I hired him and started working on my language, it forced me to pause and reflect on like, okay, wait a minute. What does my life look like now versus what did it look like then? That awareness alone, was like, oh, well, what I did then isn't working now because how things were then is not working now. So it was literally like a light a switch flipped of like, oh, I'm not, and that's where this whole thing came from, honor the season you're in. I'm not honoring that, right? Mm -hmm. And then I started to do less and I noticed I was more confident because I'm keeping promises to myself. And then the more I flex that confidence muscle, I was able to notice the body composition changes. I was happier with my husband. Like it just infiltrated in all parts of my life. Mm. So let me ask you this. This is a, this is a very key. Uh, you said something here that I, I want to touch on. Okay. You said that you started doing less and you saw a change in your body composition. Is that true? Okay. Because. So, and, go, ahead, go ahead. Please, please. No, 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 no. Well, take I, the in, ship and go. In the moment, I didn't know this. Like, and I'm a nutritionist. I do this for a living. But this is why I need a coach. I need an unbiased perspective. I need someone to call me out on my crap. Sorry, can I say that word? Here? <laughs> yes, you can. Say, can. Okay. Yes, you can. I need someone to call me out and say, like, hey, knowing and doing are two different things. You know what to do, but you're not doing it because you're leading with emotion versus logic, right? I I knew like logically, when you exercise a lot, the energy demand is higher, therefore you're going to eat more. I was also breastfeeding. I was also constantly restricting, therefore I would have to like use the willpower and find more discipline. No, I was just hungry. So then in turn, I ate a lot. The second I slowed down, I took a breath, my nervous system calmed down a little bit. Oh, I'm not as hungry. I'm not gonna binge anymore because my body's finally chilled out after 18 months of beating yourself up. It, and the, the beating yourself up, like you're, I love what you said. I know what to do. I can't tell you how many times being a coach, right? For over a decade, people will say, well, I know what to do. I'm just not doing it. There, there's a saying that we have in proclivity, curiosity kills conflict. And we say that because if you, if you, 
make something a question instead of a statement, I know what to do. That's a statement. I'm not doing it. Now we're creating a characteristic of ourselves that I'm failing. Do I know what to do? How should I accomplish it? This creates a shift in, in perspective and mindset of being able to go, wait a second. If I ask myself the question, I leave behind the judgment. When I make a statement, I tend to make the judgment. And if I make that judgment over and over again, 18 months later, I'm going to create this character in my head where I'm the villain or I'm incapable of, or there's nothing that I can do. I continue to put on weight and so on and so forth. And it sounds like to me, you had somebody to come in and go, let me start questioning these things a little bit. And you start going, oh, well, wait a second. And so what were some of the things that you started doing at that 18 month mark? We are like, whoa, I got to change things. What was some of the like main things that you were like, man, when I started doing this, this helped my central nervous system come down, which helped my hormones. I started sleeping better. And I started, what was that for you? I started sleeping more. I would cut out the three 30 alarm to get on my bike to cycle for 90 minutes. Like, what are you even doing? Right? Like my kid historically is not a good sleeper. So I was already sleep deprived and now I'm getting up earlier. No. So I started sleeping more. Um, I also started to prioritize strength training over cardio. Like, again, I knew we need to lift weights to change your body, right? Your muscle creates your shape. I want to change my shape. I need more muscle. And I just was like, well, I got to burn the calories. I, I need calorie burn. And that, how to do that is through cardio. No, I'm going to think long-term. I, so I switched the mindset, I guess. Like, yes, I started lifting weights, cutting out the cardio for the purpose of calorie burn. I love running. I am a trail runner. I will always love it. So I did it for joy, not for punishment, not for the calories, right? Um, I switched the mindset to what's going to benefit me in three weeks, not in three hours sort of thing. Mm, the long-term game. Weird, right? Uh, simple and easy are not the same thing. We say that quite often, right? Consistency is, is king, right? We, repetition is the mother of all skills, right? Th being able to get into those simple things can be uh, challenging for a lot because when I don't have a lot of time, Jim, I want results when? Right now. Or even yesterday would be great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> and so for the, the, the women that are out there uh, who are living that lifestyle, they haven't had the moment to be I to slow down. What is it that they, what's the first steps that they can start doing to be able to start stepping back? Like when you get somebody who's like wired out, they're like to their wits end. What's some of the first things that you start doing with them? Awareness. Like we have to become aware of what we're doing and then acknowledge like, Hey, is this actually working? Right. And that's hard. We have to take a look in the mirror and say, like, I've been doing this for X amount of time. You're probably exhausted. Right. Yeah. It's probably disheartening, constantly doing the same thing and constantly feeling like a failure. All right. So what what is it? What is it the thing that you're doing? Let's awareness proceeds change. We cannot change what we don't know. So I first and foremost, like you have to figure out where you are and then become more intentional with your actions. Right. If we kind of just blindly go through, well, the uh, the uh, celebrity trainer says to get 90 minutes of cardio in a, a day. Right. Well, OK, but is that how you're intentionally you want to intentionally spend your time? Right. Mm -hmm. Or are you better off like just being more active throughout the day and focusing on your non-exercise activity? Now you've got 90 minutes back in your day, probably a little bit more energy and you probably burnt more calories over the course of the day, because you were just generally more active as opposed to that 90 minute stint, right? So it's starting with that awareness and then taking it into its intention, like intentional action. And I love the, the self-awareness. We're huge on uh, awareness. It can be a very scary thing. I, I want to balance these two, right? And then get your reflection on them. What's the difference between self-awareness and self-care? I think self-awareness is part of self-care, 
right? Like when you can, without judgment, say, this is where I am, right? Um, without, again, stay curious, not judgmental. Without that judgment, you are caring for yourself. You're not making it a good or a bad. You're simply stating, this is where I am. This is where I want to be. And this is the most efficient way to get there, the most effective way to get there. That is self-care because now you're not going to be doing those, making those changes from a place of hate. It's more from a place of love. You can't hate yourself into loving yourself. So mm. that awareness is a form of self-care. I don't know. It sounds weird, but that's how my brain connects it. I love it. I love it. And I, I, I agree with you. And you've already mentioned a few things in terms of, of self-care that I want to highlight uh, for the listeners, right? When it comes to self-care, you guys, we tend to think like, I need to go take a vacation or I need to find more time to go get a massage. And all those, those things can be beneficial. When you are strapped on time and you got a kid and you got a business and you got to be able to like, oh, well, let me find out the babysitter to be able to come over so that I can go and get a massage. But then when it's time to get my massage, the babysitter's sick and now all of a sudden I don't get my massage, right? And that can just crush someone if that's what their belief is in their only parts of self-care. One of the, some of the things that you've said, and I'd love to be able to dive into to other components of self-care, the self-care that maybe a lot of us don't think about, but you talked about your non-exercise activity throughout the day. That's a big one to be able to highlight that that can be self-care, correct? Yeah, for sure. It's funny. You were talking and I thought I checked in with a client this week and she's like, hey, I'm not going to check in with you this week. I'm just not taking care of myself. It is what it is. It's the time of year. We'll connect next week. And I was like, okay, we're going to have a conversation about this, right? And there's two, there's two different conversations that we can have. We can say, you know what? In this season, it's going to last a week. Christmas is almost over, and that's where her overwhelm is coming from. In this season, this week, okay, you can't take care of yourself. You have to be put on the back burner. Your plate literally is just too full. That's fine. Okay, we'll accept that. It's going to change. It's temporary, whatever. Or we can have the conversation of like, you think you're not taking care of yourself because the things that you're doing, you're not intentionally saying this is caring for, for yourself. Are you drinking water every day? That is a form of self-care in different seasons of life. Are you going out for your walks every day? Because I know she's going for her walks every day. That is a form of self-care in the season of life. Yes, I would love to, you to check all 12 boxes we want to check every day, but it's not going to be realistic every day. That doesn't mean you're not taking care of yourself. It's just you're changing your definition of consistency in this moment. Mm, gosh, that's so good. Sorry, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah you're, you're answering all my questions and the questions okay. I don't even have. Okay. I, I, I want to bring Emily into this because she has been in talk about seasons. And I love this, like honoring the season that you're in. Um, a lot of the, we, we talk about having percentages to get to your check mark. So I, you can still get a check mark if you're doing 25%. Uh, you can still get a check mark if you're doing 50%. So we have like a 25% meal, a 50% meal, a 75% meal. And then of course, your 100% meal, you know, the meal that's like, man, that's dialed in and it's perfect and so on and so forth. But what's our 75? What's our 50? What's our 25? A lot of people don't know the, the differences in there. Now, Emily's been going through a, a, a pretty rough season uh, holidays coming up. She has a kid, the kid's not, Dan's be not sleeping so well. There's different things going on. Emily, how have you honored yourself through this season? If we can give a little background to GM and the listeners, mm -hmm. what's been going on? Yeah. So, I mean, as for a lot of people, the holidays can bring up, um, some extra pressure in terms of how we spend our time, like you were talking about. And with that, um, I, I'm a recovering people pleaser and so it's, I'm continuing to find ways to, to slow that down in terms of like, well, it's like, I have to take time my to go mm, instead of my usual reaction or action to please other people. How can I do that for myself? And my son hasn't been sleeping very well. He wakes up multiple times in the night or wakes up super early. And usually that's when I get my workout in, as like you were saying. And so I, I was sick also. I had a really bad cold for, uh, really bad for two weeks and it lingered for another two and, I, and I'm just now getting over it. And this was before Thanksgiving. And 
it's I, exercise is my favorite thing to do. It's my favorite activity, but I've done maybe five workouts in the last month like, and they were all under 30 minutes. And for me, I recognize with a lack of sleep, I, my self-care is sleeping in. It's taking the rest where I can. It's not rushing. It's saying no to the event. I had like three events scheduled in one day last week and I was like, mm, still not feeling well. I want to spend time with my son. He's, I could tell he's feeling disconnected with me. I'm going to say no. Right. And so it's those little things in my head. Those are, those are all huge self cares for me because one, I'm going to, it's going to make me feel better, refill my cup. But two, like, I, I just know it's, it's hard for me to, to skip the workout, but I, at, I look at the other things like at what cost, if I were to get up early and do the workout, it's not going to be, it's not going to be as beneficial. And so me, that to me, that's treating myself. And so a, self, a form of self care. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And w- what have been some of the, I know you've talked about, Hey, you've in this season, uh, your self-care is sleeping and little more. Is there any other things that things that you've done for self-care during this time? Um, yeah, a few more things I've, I've started seeing a, a therapist to, again, for the recovering people pleaser in me. It's been challenging in certain situations, whether it be with family, certain relationships with my son even, um, to where I'm breaking it down and I'm allowing myself to feel the emotions, cry more, right? All the things that I used to suppress, now I'm actually diving into it, which can feel a little challenging at first, but I know it's the next right step and it's feeling really good to make progress there. So I'm taking time where I normally would be like, I don't have time to go see a therapist. <laughs> like that's crazy talk. But it's extremely helpful for me in this season. I'm like, this is what I need. This is my self-care. I love it. I love it. So GM, when you have people that that come to you, what would you say are like the top three um, pain points that they're dealing with when they come when they come and they're they've reached their breaking point? What are usually the top three pain points that you see with your your clientele? They have no time, or they believe they have no time, whatever. Um, they're inconsistent, right? They they just can't seem to stay on track. That mindset of like what consistency means, it's very black and white. They don't know how to live in the gray. Um, and I think focusing too much on like the sexy things, right? Like the the I always say like the super sexy, the supplements, the nutrition timing, the perfect macros, that's what's going to lead them to being successful. When it's mm. like, well, if you're dehydrated, does the, the supplement actually matter, right? Like, why don't we work on like the foundation? We have, I have a pyramid of success and we have to work on the foundation before we can get to the tippy top. And in that foundation, it's like, are you sleeping? Are you managing your stress? Do you have proper boundaries in place? Not just for you, but for like, or not just to keep people out, but to like keep you in your life. Emily, when you were talking, I thought about like boundaries, like that's huge. You're holding a boundary to keep you in your life more. Like that is a form of self-care if I've ever heard of it, right? Mm -hmm. So I I would say like the time, the consistency, and then staying focused on your foundational things that you can take with you when you're sick and holidays, vacations, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the tool belt, right. Of being able to carry those tools with you all the time, instead of like these really high demand ass that are needed from, uh, different programs, uh, that can work really well. If you don't have a kid, if your time isn't strapped, that, that you're not working 40 hours a week, they can work. Cause you're like, Oh, I can invest that time in there. But as you found out too, I'm, I'm sure you did things a lot differently when you were an elite athlete than you are now. Yet comparing those two, how do how does the elite athlete GM feel to the mom and business owner GM now? Are, are there differences? Are there similarities? I think I'm a little bit more accept accepting whereas before i had more control and now there's a lot less in my control but i'm more accepting of that right like straight up radical acceptance when my kid would wake up at 3 30 a.m every day for a year and a half like i fought it i hired sleep consultants i did all the things he was broken 
No, I just need to accept he's going to wake up early, right? Whereas prior to that life, before I had a kid, if there was something I didn't like, I would I would fix it because I was in control of the situation. It was just me and my dogs. Of course I was in control, right? So I would find a way. And now, like, I'm realizing, well, the way might just be accepting the season and knowing it's going to pass. I love that. I love that. It, 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 my thought process here is like, you know, water finds the path of least resistance. That's why rivers don't flow straight, right? They curve, particularly here in, in the Sierra Nevadas, because there's granite or there's rocks that you're, the water's not going to be able to get through. So it goes around. And I feel in, in, in life, being able to have that mindset or attitude of like, wow, there's a lot of resistance here. Okay, well, where can I go? Instead of I have to try to push through this or climb through this. Uh, that's what I'm hearing is one of the things that you have become, you call it an expert or uh, very good at, is being able to, instead of try to push through, to be able to go around. Yes. And that's even going to, and like relating back to like, how do we get more time back in our life? How much time did I spend obsessing over, like we'll use the sleep, for example, obsessing over my son's sleep, trying to hire sleep consultants, reading the blogs, just generally stressing about it. That's exhausting. I had no energy because it was all spent towards focusing on that. And it's the same conversation. If you're focused on what you hate about your body or what you want to change with your body, like that's exhausting. Constantly thinking about food and how you can cut calories or I'm so hungry. When can I have my next meal? That's mm-hmm. taking mental energy. When you don't have the mental energy, you're not going to be efficient with your time. It's like, it's all connected. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, the time, the time, the time, such a, such a finite resource. I, I want to come back to strategies of being able to say no, right? We believe here at Proclivity that no and yes are complete sentences. Yet, how do you help your clientele start setting boundaries and using the word no? I think it's through conversation. I because when you're in it, you don't you don't see that as an option. Like that's just not an option. I I can't I can't tell them I can't tell them no. It's what I have to do, right? But through that discussion and getting someone else's like, well, you're saying this. But what I'm hearing and seeing is this, obviously within scope of practice, I'm not a therapist, right? Uh, For example, I talked to a lady yesterday. She just came off of six weeks of travel in seven different time zones, like the most insane schedule I've ever heard of. And she like started crying because of her, her Christmas cards. It was not working out. It sent her into a tizzy. And I'm like, why are you even doing Christmas cards this year? Send an email to everyone. Hi, this year was really crazy. We're good. We'll talk to you next year. Like, And she was like, oh, yeah, you're right. Like it hadn't even been a consideration to not do Christmas cards until someone came in and said, you can free up some of that stress because it's not about the Christmas cards. It's about you're exhausted, right? So I think the conversation of seeing what other options that are out there that you're just so blinded because this is where your life has been. It helps. Mm. It might take someone else's um eyeballs for you to get more awareness of the entire situation, not just being blinded by what's directly in front of you. Mm, I love that. Yes, we, we, um, we have a lot of our clients answer the question, what is the outcome? In one sentence, like, hey, no, 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 tell us the outcome of having and putting this energy into Christmas cards. What's the outcome? Like the true outcome? Oh, to let people know what's going on in our lives. Okay. Well, can we do that in a different facet? Right. Does it need to be five hours of stressing over the perfect picture where we got to go get pictures as a family? And then I got to figure out, you know, the, the perfect design. And then we got to get everybody's address and then we got to send the whole thing out. Being able to pause for a second and go, what's my outcome here? How does this benefit the the areas of my life that I'm looking to improve? Does it or does it not? If it doesn't, then why am I chasing this outcome? 
is there something about me that wants this outcome? Is this just something that I've always done? Being able to question that, it's like, I mean, I had a um, tradition for 16 years called Christmas Eve Eve Sushi. And we all got together on the 23rd and we got rented a bus and there'd be 75 people and we would dress up in costumes and we'd all eat sushi, right? The day before Christmas Eve. And people loved it. And then it got to a point where I was like, too much of a lift. And I shut it down. And people were like, what? Why? That was such a good tradition. And we sometimes get stuck on these traditions or it's always how I've done it. We use binary words like always and never that trap us into a, a, a position that makes us feel this is what we have to do. Right? But this is full permission for everybody out there. You have full permission from GM, myself, and Emily to say no and to not do the tradition, the chocolate, you know, mug tradition that you have to go find the perfect mug and you have to do the coffee mug exchange. You don't have to do it. If it's, if it's not, if that's a different season, like GM says, you have full permission not to do that. Do you agree in being able to give that that same type of permission, Jim? I just want to make sure I'm speaking for you here. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. I encourage it. I encourage you to say no more because the more you do it, the easier it's going to get. Yes, yes, yes. Emily, I want to give you some, uh, some opportunity to sneak in here. You've been listening. Is there any, any questions that are coming up for, for you for GM? Yeah. Is there any kind of conversation that comes up with you and clients uh, when it comes to slowing down or doing less? There's a lot of fear out there. Like, is this the right thing? Because it feels counterintuitive to a lot of uh, people. And for me, when people ask that question, like the first thing that comes to mind is we got to trust the process. But is there anything uh, else that you have in that conversation with clients into learning how to trust that process, trust themselves? Is there anything else that goes into that for you? I always want to like um, agree with them and say that it is that it's hard, right? It is so counterintuitive. Like if you want to get better at riding a bike, you're going to ride your bike more. And now you're telling me that I want to change my body. I want to lose weight, whatever it is. I need to do less of the thing that's supposed to help me get there. I need to do less of exercise. I need to do less of fitness. So first acknowledging like, yeah, it's counterintuitive, 100%. But then again, differentiating between logic and emotion and the education piece around, okay, your stressed out system, what happens when we're stressed out? What are the stressors? What stressors can we remove? So the education piece is huge. Um, what was your question? No, yeah. And how, it just like, how do you, how do you walk your clients through that of like to actually trust that process in slowing down. And I do the same th too. I'm, I explain the science of like, well, when your nerve system is overregulated, these are the things that happens. Your body stores fat, you slow down, your hormones get imbalanced, right? All those things is helpful for people to explain. And that is an eye opener. But yeah. Is there anything else that you mentioned as well? Yeah, we, so having a plan in place and like just trusting it, like spelling it out as much as I can. And like you said, we just have to trust the process. But along the way, here are the, the we're going to climb a ladder. And you want to get to the top of the ladder. Well, these are the steps that are going to help you get there. So every time you hit a step, you know you're making progress. And it's that constant conversation back and forth, the internal conversation. Um, it's, it's a lot of just, hey, you hired me. This is hard. I understand. But what you were, what were you doing? What, if, what you were doing was working, you wouldn't be here right now. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's that conversation. Yeah. Cause it is, it's just blind trust. 100%. Yeah. And I always thank my clients. I'm like, thank you for trusting me at the end of the, our time together. I'm like, I know it's tough. We've got to trust the process. And, and like you said, uh, if you're, if what you've been doing hasn't been working, we got to try something new. And we always say change creates change and change is hard for people. And so no, uh, change is challenging, but also it's what, it's what is necessary. That's why we, that's why people hire Nothing us. changes. Yeah. Nothing changes if nothing changes. Right. Uh, right. I think too, becoming, getting a little bit, um, 
approaching your progress in a different way, right? You want to be at the top of that ladder. Well, in order to get to the top of the ladder, you need to hit each step. So stop focusing on the top. Let's focus on, well, what are we going to expect to happen along the way? Mm -hmm. If someone comes to me and their body composition changes their number one goal, I'm going to be very upfront and tell them, I'm not tra- trying to change your body in month one. Like, and they're like, huh, what? I just hired you to change. No, we're not. I, I can change your body. You want to lose weight? Cut off your arm. There, you lost weight. That's ridiculous. <laughs> but also, that's a weight loss, right? Instead, I want you to change your life so that it's not a weight loss problem that you have anymore. You can maintain the weight loss. So we have to change the habits and the actions, the beliefs. We have to change that before we can get to the actual weight. So the process is slow right from the beginning. And I think getting very clear on that and just the constant reminders of like, let's focus on the steps to help you climb the ladder first. That's going to get you to the top. Yeah. I love that 100% of the the steps in the process. Most people completely block that out of their head. (laughs) So it's a good reminder. Yeah. Yeah. The being able to be focused on the, the, the journey part, right. We've heard that, that saying before, instead of the getting to the destination, right. Focus on the actions, right. Not the outcome. Right. And I think too, when people start, when people start to feel better, like it's not they're they feel the difference. Like I had one lady Mm. say, Oh my God, I did yard work this year for the first time in three years. I haven't had the energy to do that. Like those small glimmers that you don't even realize are going to happen along the way that makes it like, okay, I can take another step. I can keep doing this. I can keep trusting. That's right. That's right. So before we get into, uh, in getting into like the nitty gritty of like, Hey, what are your top tips in being able to create this self care to be able to manage this time? Right. What, what are some of the challenges, the common hurdles um, that, that people face when it comes to self-care practices or caring about themselves. Feeling guilty for taking time for themselves and mm-hmm. feeling like, well, I'm a mom. Like I need to, if I, I don't have a lot of time. So the time I have has to go towards like my husband, my kids, my family, my work. Like I don't, I don't know if it's like a worthiness thing or just a belief thing, but the guilt around investing the time, the energy, the money into themselves. And how do you get them over that hurdle? I think we have to help people see that that investment of time is like, it's so cliche. It's so cliche, but it's so true. That investment of all of those resources is actually going towards you showing up better, differently and in a better way for the people you most care about, right? Like when you aren't taken care of, like don't eat lunch, don't eat, don't eat today. Right. And then you're overstimulated at 4 PM. How are you going to react now? You've eaten today. You're overstimulated at 4 PM. How are you going to react? Probably on a well-fed stomach, you're able to tolerate more. You're able to be a little bit more patient, right? Cause you're not on edge from being hungry as well as 800 noises coming from you at all different angles, right? So I think if we can see the difference of, oh, eating is taking care of myself, I need to learn how to eat to continue to dive deeper into taking care of myself, I'm going to be more patient with my Mm. my son or my husband or whoever it is. Mm. I love that. It's like going back to what you were saying earlier of like, just make sure that you drink water today. Because I can tell you what the days that I am, I don't have my element and I haven't drank my water, man, I, all of a sudden I start having a headache or my energy levels are low and so on and so forth. You, you don't think that that's going to impact the way that I walk through my day? Oh no, it's going to absolutely impact the way I'm walking through the day, the way that I'm eating food, the way that I'm talking to other people, the, what, the energy that I'm bringing to the people that are around me. And we're talking H2O folks. We're not talking counting all your macros and all your proteins and all your this and that. We're just talking, are you getting your water and how much of a game changer that can be? Which brings me to the next question. If we were to say, all right, here's GM's cheat sheet to self-care. What, what would be your top three that we can give to our listeners? 
it's so boring, right? But you're going to drink water because that's going to help regulate everything. You're going to set boundaries with bedtime. Like I understand after the kids go to bed is the only time you have alone. And also in this season, wow, I'm sorry. You're not going to have alone time tonight. You're going to take that extra 40 minutes and go to bed. Like you have to be rested. You need your sleep from both a physiological as well as mental and emotional perspective. Like you need to prioritize your sleep. And then I would say some sort of movement and it doesn't have to be sexy. It doesn't have to be with weights. It, you can do it with your kid, walk laps in your driveway, but con- making that intentional effort towards like, this is for me, right? Like literally I've gotten 2000 steps walking circles in my very tiny driveway before. It sounds crazy. And also like, I feel so accomplished. He just drew for, with chalk for 20 minutes and I got all my steps in, right? So when we're, starting our day with our morning water when we're starting our day because we were successful with going to bed on time last night Mm -hmm. right because a good morning starts the night before and then when we're doing some sort of movement it doesn't need to be intense hey if you can throw intensity in a couple times a week even better but just some sort of movement outside is even better i think those are the three like most foundational things that you can do to take care of yourself Agreed. That's literally the first few steps in what we teach too. So we're on the same page. Uh, absolutely. 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 And there's one part in there that I want to, I want us to touch because I, people tend to struggle with what you brought up in the second one, which is, well, I finally put the kids down. So now it's like, I, I want to be able to just check Instagram real quick, or I want to be able to watch that movie, or I want to be able to do those things yet it can be really detrimental. Like this, the benefit of actually being asleep for an additional 40 minutes to an hour compared to watching the you know TV show or scrolling on Instagram is exponential, particularly when it starts compounding. And so how do you, how do you help people break through that? Like, oh, I just want that alone time. Like, I'm very curious because we get that as well. Where else can you get it, right? And if you're using your alone time to be on social media, are you actually like alone? Like, are you spending time with yourself or are you just blindly getting lost in other people, right? Like pick up a fiction book and like read some smut or something before bed. That's going to be a lot better for your central nervous system than scrolling the blue, the blue light for 40 minutes, right? I think part of it is finding time throughout the day. And then like, okay, you had a really hard day. It's a Tuesday. It was really hard. You just need the 40 minutes on your phone. Do it. Fine. But don't let it become the norm. Mm. Right? Like, again, it's not black and white. I could say like every night you need to be in bed as soon as your kid goes to bed. Oh, that's not realistic. Right? You're setting yourself up for failure there. So give yourself the permission on occasion. But like you said, when it happens every night, it's compounding. So where can you take that alone time earlier in the day? I don't know. The screen is kind of like a big thing in my life. I don't know how I feel about it. And also I'm going to let my kid watch Paw Patrol for 30 minutes. If I just need a break sometime, like he's going to, he's not going to be a worse person before it. I'm going to be a better person for it. So everyone wins, right? It's the sacrifice give and take in different spots at different times of day. As long as it's not compounding, and you're not hurting anyone. Yes. Yes. I'm so glad you touched on that. Cause I can tell you guys right now, I do not remember the cartoon that I watched, but I do remember when my mom lost her SHIT on me. Now, I didn't, as a kid, don't know because, you know, I kept her up or there was a lot going on with work or there was stress in our relationship. But I can tell you, I can tell you when my mom lost her shit and it scared the hell out of me. Not the cartoon. Not the car. I can't tell you the cartoon. I can't tell you anything about the cartoons I watched yet. It seems that we get so locked in. I'm like, Oh, we can't put them in front of a TV. They can't watch frozen for the 1700th time again. Right. That's kind of, it's going to, it's going to be so terrible for them. No, no, no. If that's, what's going to give you the peace of mind to be able to close your eyes for a second while they're watching TV. So you don't lose your S H I T on them later. (laughs) That's going to be the most, at least from my experience, you guys, I'm not projecting that on anybody else. And my mom did everything she possibly could, could, and I love my mom, 
yet I remember those times when she lost her cookies. And that that created some trauma with me. And there was stuff that I had to unwind with my mom and, you know, myself and my relationships. And so I love that bringing that fact up of, hey, you guys, it's okay. And be careful on making it a habit. Yeah, I'm pregnant again. So I'm due, I'm, I'm having a second kid, he's due June 1st. And I like reached out to a girlfriend recently, like, I'm just so tired by two o'clock. What do I do? And she's, she's like big anti screen. And she was like, just turn the TV on. I'm like, you of all people are saying this. But for a second, I had to pause and think, you know what, like, this is a season. Like, sure, when the baby comes, that season is probably going to be even more aggressive. And we're probably gonna have to lean on the screen even more. But also, again, it's a season. It's not my first go to all of the time. But if we're done with arts and crafts and we've done played in the playroom. We can't go out like we've done everything. I just need a break. It's not going to be forever, right? It's not every day, but some days it's the, the most, it's the simplest solution. Yes. Oof. Very true. <laughs> I, I love that. I love the seasons. I love the seasons. That's that the being able to adapt, you guys, is so vital in all your seasons, whether you're, you're a mom, whether you're a dad whether you're in a relationship or not in a relationship, these are all seasons and being able to allow yourself and give yourself permission to flex in those seasons, that your training is going to look different, that your time is going to look different, that your sleep may look a little different, like that all these things may be a little bit different, but it's not forever. It's a season. It's a season. And I think talking to other people too, like Emily, I listened to a podcast that you guys had done about, pregnancy I think you had your postpartum coach on there with you and hearing you guys talk about like how things changed in trimester one versus two versus three I was like oh this is so relatable this is exactly what I needed to hear as I'm like kind of reaching the halfway point I've done this before right this is my second pregnancy I get it and also hearing other people's experiences feeling like I'm having a conversation with you guys it's like it makes me feel more normal it makes mm-hmm. me feel more sound in the choices I'm making. So I think that support, like I never even met you and I'm like, oh, she's supporting me on my pregnancy journey, right? Just through listening to your experience. I think that can be huge. That's awesome. Appreciate you telling us that. It is awesome. It is awesome. This is this entire uh, episode has been awesome. And I, I want us uh, to, to wrap this sucker up. Um, GM, it's, I've learned a lot. And I love the season and I'm, um, I'm going to ride on that for sure. Uh, you're a season specialist is what I'm going <laughs> to call you. And um, how does someone get in contact with you if they're listening? They're like, man, that girl is resonating with me. I want to work with her. How, do, how does somebody well, I, first start off? Uh, I'm on social media. That's where I, I live. GM underscore K. Super simple. It's my initials. I also have a website, it's gmkcoaching.com. And I also have a very teeny tiny podcast that I started. Um, It is called Honor the Season You're In. So I'm on Spotify and Apple. I think I'm on Audible or Amazon, whatever their podcast space is too. But website, Instagram, podcast. Bang. There it is. There it is. And if somebody wanted, uh, do you have any like free resources um, that people can get into that will help them start understanding the work you do? Uh, If you go over to Instagram, I have a bunch of downloadable things in my link. I will usually once a week share one or two of them on my story. So I'm super active over there. Cool. Cool. Awesome. In January, I do want to share that in January, I'm going to be hosting a free webinar on how to optimize your time so that you can, or how to optimize, I should say, optimize your energy to get more time back in your day. Um, it would probably be mid-January. I haven't picked an exact date, but that's something that will be free. People can look out for as well. Ooh, let us know. We would love to be part of that. We would love to be able to, to come on in. Emily, anything else for Jim? No, that's it. Thank you so much. It's been uh, an honor to have you. And we align with uh, almost everything, I think, so far we, that we've heard from you. And we appreciate your your time and your energy. It's been awesome. Yeah, this has been great. Thanks for chatting with me. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, guys, that's a wrap. 
episode 132 with GM, we're, we always appreciate you guys tuning in. We always appreciate you guys listening to it. It means the world to us. That's it. Wrapping up 132. We'll come back next week for episode 133. And until then. Best day ever. Best day ever. <laughs>